Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the Art to Grab Tall Ranch. I know that's been a while, but this episode is going to focus on something that a lot of people think they know about, but really do not understand. I'm going to focus on tortoise shell anatomy. If that's something you find interesting and you want to know more about, stick around. Great, you're still there. In this episode, I wanted to discuss tortoise shell anatomy because of stuff that I see online all the time. Recently, somebody posted a picture of a turtle with a couple of numbers painted on its shell. And the overwhelming sentiment of people posting was, that's so unhealthy for the tortoise, you're gonna kill it, turtles die from that. And somebody posted an article from Florida Fish and Wildlife from, I think it was like 2015, maybe 2016, uh, that showed gopher tortoises in Florida whose shells have been completely painted over. Other sentiments that I see in the comments are, the shell is a living and breathing thing, it's porous, toxins will soak into the shell. Um, they absorb vitamins through their shells. There's just so many things that people are saying and pretty much all it's wrong, unfortunately. So let's talk about a tortoise's shell. What is a tortoise shell? Well, you can see is an outside hard layer. And then beneath that is the actual bone. To use comparative anatomy, these bones are just ribs. This, the entire shell of a tortoise, is the exact same structure as the rib cage on you and me. But their shell is modified, obviously. Their ribs, instead of being little strips, are wide. And you can see right here, where these seams are, their ribs have fused together, and these are the individual ribs. Something you don't see on this, because this is a, a, obviously a dead tortoise, this was a desert tortoise that didn't make it through hibernation, unfortunately, uh, you don't see is the living membrane that is between the shell and the keratin layer. You can kind of see it right here a little bit, some of it's left, and where the scutes are separated, there's a tiny bit showing here. That is a layer that just kind of supplies blood to the outside of the bone. It also is a layer that adheres the keratin to the shell. And it really doesn't do much more than that. Now, keratin, what is this stuff? Keratin is a protein, and you can see that it, how it works on tortoises. It makes up their shells, but it also makes up their scales their nails, and their beak parts. Amazingly, keratin is the exact same protein that makes up our hair and our nails. In fact, if you've never touched a snake before or felt a tortoise or turtle, and you go like that, you're feeling the exact same thing that you would feel when you touch one of these animals. Uh, when you look behind me, there's a boa constrictor, and it has really smooth scales, so it feels identical to this. But being what it is, keratin is a dead layer, to, to put it best. Once your body produces keratin, no more nutrition, no, no more biological effort goes into that keratin. It will lay down more keratin at the bed of your nails and push it out. The same with your hair. It lays down new keratin in your roots and your hair slowly grows out. And all this is dead. That's why it doesn't hurt when we cut our hair or cut our nails. There's no nerve endings in it. There's no blood flowing to it. It's, again, it's a dead, a dead layer. Things that it is though, it's very hydrophilic. What does that mean? It absorbs water very, very well. When you take a shower and you get out of the shower, you feel your nails are a little more bendy and your hair feels a little bit uh, softer when it's wet. And uh, those of us with beards, uh, our significant others can definitely tell anybody out there that when our beards are wet, they're a lot better to feel than this scraggly, scruffy face mask that I have on. So they absorb water very well. They also absorb oils. So those of you that use nail, uh, hand and nail creams, the oils, the lipids and oils in those are soaked into it and it helps condition it. It doesn't make it healthier because it's, again, dead, but it helps condition it so that it perhaps will last a little bit longer or have a nicer shine or luster. It's not needed. You can go your entire life without ever using lotion on your hands and nails, but when you do add it, it doesn't hurt it, and it just kind of makes it look nicer. 
The exact same thing is true of tortoise or turtle shell. If you were to take a layer of oil, say coconut oil, or even if you wanted to, uh, Lubriderm skin cream, you could take that and you could, without harming the animal, rub it on its shell. It's doing the exact same job as when you put it on your own skin. Is it needed? No, not at all. Could a tortoise live its entire 100 plus year life without ever having conditioner put on its shell? Most definitely, but it doesn't hurt. When you see somebody with a shiny turtle picture or their tortoise is much, uh, is almost glowing, either they've just hosed it down and the shell is nice and wet and absorbing that moisture, or they might have put oil on it. Uh, down here in Arizona, where some tortoises are smart enough to stay out of the sun, some are out in the sun too much, every month or so, I'll take some coconut oil and go over the shell because the sun is super damaging. It, it breaks down keratin. It helps flake it away, wear it away. This, of course, was a native animal, and when you look closely at the scoots, you can see that, yeah, there is definitely some flaking that was happening because that's just the rough life, and that's what happens when something's in the sun like that. When somebody says that the shell is living and breathing, typically they're referring to the outer shell. And, you know, given our discussion about keratin, we know that's not true. I also hear very often that the shell is porous. I'm going to show you that this scoot that came off of this shell from this tortoise, which is the same as every other tortoise shell, while it may absorb water and absorb oils, it's not porous. You won't see anything drip down from it. So I've got this, I've got a little beaker of water and I'll try to not make a mess. And we'll put a little bit in here. We'll try to make a little puddle here. Don't go that way, stay in there. Now what you can see is this, there's no water coming from the bottom. It's not, my finger is still just as dry. I'm gonna go ahead and dump this over here. Ah, it's dripping down my finger, crap. What I'm trying to show you is that what happens on one side is not transferring to the other. So let me go ahead and dump this right here without messing anything. And you can see that where the water was in here, there's no water, there's no pores. Nothing went through this. On a molecular level, yes, some things can absorb into the shell. But when it comes to painting a turtle shell, which is my next point I'm gonna to get to, don't do it. This tortoise has had the shell its entire life. It knows, based on the, this, the shell configuration, when to get into the sun and when to get out of the sun. This is a light colored shell, so it knows you can probably spend a little bit more time in the sun to warm up than a tortoise with a dark shell would need. They understand this, they've lived their whole lives with it. If I were to be, you know, some silly kid or um, just some vandal and I spray painted the tortoise's shell red, I have just completely messed up its ability to thermoregulate. That is the biggest, most important reason to not paint a tortoise shell. Their shell, it's one of its most important jobs. Job number one, protection. Nice and hard, nothing getting through this, not even lion teeth. But another important job is thermal regulation, heat. If I paint the shell, I just threw that completely off. This tortoise will struggle to warm up and cool down correctly because it's done the same thing its whole life with its natural shell. Now, one reason to paint a tortoise shell, or an old reason to paint a tortoise or turtle shell, would be if you were doing a field study. Nowadays, there's little microchips. So you can find a, find a tortoise, implant a microchip, take all of your measurement data, and write down everything, take pictures of it, uh, and then you associate all of that data with the number on the chip that goes in its arm. It's about the size of a grain of rice and it's magnetic. You take a little magnetic scanner, boop, it beeps, it gives you a number, and then you correlate that number to your data. That's what we can do now. Well, those haven't been around forever. So before, people would simply take paint, usually acrylic paint, and paint a number on the tortoise's shell. That does not harm the tortoise. Uh, I've heard people say, well, it's going to inhale the vapors. As long as there's adequate airflow, you're not going to kill a tortoise from the vapors of painting numbers on its shell. If I were to take spray paint 
um, then yeah, there's a good chance that I could spray it in its eyes. I could, you know, could drip down into its mouth, you know, stuff like that. that that's bad for the tortoise. But the actual paint itself, as far as uh, off-gassing to hurt the tortoise, if you're doing small numbers, that's so unlikely. I don't even think any tortoise researchers ever thought of that. That's more people uh, going off the deep end of how something can get hurt by human activity. Now, another process that uh, field biologists use that I'm not a big fan of, but they do, is they'll take a file, uh, a little triangular shaped file, and they'll notch, put notches into the shell somewhere. So you can see there's carrots in here, yes, but at the edge, beneath the carrots, and that's bone. There are nerves in this bone, there's blood in this bone. So when you take that notch and you saw down to mark this particular tortoise, you are definitely hurting the tortoise. It'll recover, it'll get over it. I've seen box turtles got hit by a lawnmower and they lived. But that doesn't mean we should be going out and running over box turtles with lawnmowers just to give them a little immune boost. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is the method of painting some small numbers on, on a tortoise or turtle for field research and later identification is much less invasive and much less harmful than cutting notches into their shells. Again, they'll survive, but I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want somebody to take a tooth and notch into my tooth to identify me if every human looked alike. I'd be pretty unhappy about it. Now, when it comes to an oil-based paint, well, there is a chance that if it's bonded to the oils, that certain things in the paint that's bad for humans and bad for other animals and tortoises could absorb through the shell and then absorb into its bloodstream. Now, some alternatives that I've seen that were really cool, I remember reading about this back in the 90s. Somebody would take, he had a stack of pennies with different years. He would take an epoxy and put the penny so that the year was facing out. He would glue the penny to the box turtles. And every year he would go out and find the same box turtles or find new ones and add those. So that's a pretty, not very invasive, definitely not painful way if you're out doing your own personal field biology and you don't have the money and resources of a university, we'll take, take all the same coins or maybe a different coin for different species and have different years. And that's how you can mark a turtle for, for follow-up research. If you didn't know how a tortoise shell grew, what happens? The bones expand, they start growing. Well, you know, this, it's not very flexible. You know, that's why it's here, it's, it's protective. Just like your nails, the, the thicker they are, they're not very flexible. So what happens is you can see these little ridges, little ridges, every time, or excuse me, as a tortoise shell grows, new keratin is deposited around the edge. And then it's deposited around the edge. And as it grows, it keeps getting deposited. This can happen, uh, I've seen some of my tortoises with 10 of these ridges in just one season. So a lot of people think you count these ridges and that's how you get the age. That's not very true because a tortoise can grow fast or slow any given year and how fast or slow they're growing dictates how much keratin is being laid down until it gets to the very edge. So knowing that this is important, the edges are important for shell growth, if you are doing field research and you're putting uh, epoxy onto the tortoise, uh, that's used like when people put tracking GPS devices, it's best to try to center it on the scoot because if you put epoxy on the boundary of a scoot, that can inhibit some of the growth. That can inhibit the proper movement of the keratin as the bone underneath of it is growing. Something to think about. I mean, I've seen a lot of tortoises and turtles uh, with GPS trackers on where people just didn't know that, didn't care about it. Um, I've never done a long-term study to see how much damage is actually done because a lot of them, they don't stay on there for very long. The epoxy wears off. They have to go recollect the, the transmitters because the batteries die. So if it was just maybe a season or two, I would guess that it wouldn't do very much damage. But if it's left on there long-term and you're not able to recover that animal, then yeah, it's gonna cause some malformation in that area where the bone is trying to grow. Now, the next subject that we'll talk about relative to the tortoise shell has to do with UV absorption. Do their shells absorb UV? They're